views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening. Welcome to the Bronx Buzz. This is Bronx Nets program. Goodness gracious, I hope you know all about it by now. We've been here for years. Um, we talk about um, uh, or talk with editors and writers and photographers and filmmakers and journalists. And one of the nice features, we say anybody who puts something out in the Bronx, we will um, deal with and talk about and talk to. And in our second segment, uh, we're going to do an art uh, gallery exhibit that um, is one of a kind. And of course, it's the Bronx. And um, you'll enjoy that. Uh, but to get started, uh, we're going to talk to an opinion writer, an op-ed piece writer, who wrote an excellent piece for a Gotham Gazette. So uh, let's say uh, good evening to Carl Palmquist. Nice to have you with us, Carl. Hi, Gary. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm going to give the credits. Carl is the vice chair of the uh, local uh, group of the Sierra Club and is co-founder of Project Defeat Denial, which is what we're going to talk about today. Maybe we ought to start right there. What is, who is Project Defeat Denial? And uh, this was an op-ed piece you wrote in Gotham Gazette. Go ahead. Yes, so thanks for asking about that. Project Defeat Denial is something that I co-founded very recently, uh, sort of inspired by a lot of this work that I've been doing both with the CR Club, as well as some of the uh, research I've been doing about plastic pollution. And it really was inspired by the idea that these, uh, these things that we consume, you know, plastics, other items, right. uh, they don't go anywhere. So we really need to, at the consumer level, be aware of that, be aware of sort of what we're using and we need to be able to access a better, more sustainable, sort of eco-friendly items. Uh, I, the, the, the notion of access, we were just talking about it before the show. I should have had, here, here's an example, just sitting here right on my table. What do you do with this when it's done? This is just a common Sharpie. They sell, I, we could look up how many they sell a year. I guess by now, they're all uh, the ones that we've used are in the bottom of the ocean somewhere or, or in a landfill somewhere, right? These things live for 40,000 years, right? That, that's what the issue is. Exactly. So it's, it's really complicated because uh, for, you know, the last however many years, we've been sort of living in this uh, society where we're given these choices on uh, what to buy, and they're not really choices if you want to look at it from the environmental perspective. And, and yeah, yeah, and, and listen, there's, there's no question about it. I, I want to uh, just mention okay, so the article that you did was for Gotham Gazette The J Dangerous Persistence of Plastic and What New York City Needs to Do About It. I am in agreement with you that we need consumer education, and I want to get started here with the notion. Of, uh, of things that we consume and the people who make them and package them. I mean, I, I forgot what it was that I bought the other day. And I was like, <laughs> this plastic that I got to practically get a, a pickaxe to get in. And, you know, it, it just it, crazy. Is there any effort on the production end? Of course, we have a big problem with suppliers and goods right now. Is there any um, effort on that end to deal with some of these issues? I think there uh, definitely are some efforts uh, from that perspective. You know, that there's not as much legislation with regard to that at the city level, but at the state and national level, uh, they're considering things like extended producer responsibility, uh, potentially other uh, sort of restrictions on packaging and uh, those types of uh, things that can reduce, like you're saying, this just giving us plastic, even in the things uh, we order. One thing that I will say uh, that I think we can really do at the local level, though, is promote uh, local buying. So one thing that we talk about on our group's website on Project to Beat Denial is the idea of making sustainable items accessible to people in a way that they can you know, walk to it or a short drive to it, making sustainability accessible for all, you know, support local business and support 
small, sustainable business. Right. Uh, there, there was something that you wrote about, which is you called it Skip the Straw. And uh, listen, I'm very happy to use paper straws or whatever they give uh, or not. I mean, if, if you meet me in the bar, I generally don't like to drink with a straw, you know, but that's another story. Um, it, You know, I was very happy with that that legislation and that concept. But to me, it was this big when we have a problem that's, you know, I can't fit it all in the camera. That's that big. Um, what, what are your thoughts about this? Skip the straw. Concept. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's a very good point. Uh, and I think a lot of activists, even people who, you know, were introducing the bill, sort of acknowledge that it's a small step. And uh, in that same uh, sort of idea, uh, another piece of legislation that I write about, Skip the Stuff, uh, which targets a very similar sort of concept here instead of straws. Stuff, you say stuff. stuff. So, uh. so like plastic cutlery um, that, yeah. you know, you get thrown in these to-go bags, take-out <laughs> bags. Uh, that is Again, up. what do you? I should have straws and what, what, uh, excuse me, forks and spoons. What do you do with that? Absolutely. So I, I don't even use those. So they just get given to us, right? Yeah. And so this, this skip the stuff, very similar to skip the straw, would make it so that you have to ask for it. And again, I think the idea here and activists, advocates are very aware of it. It's a small step. But I think the critical thing here is it's it's a really great step in the right direction. First, it will reduce the amount of plastic that we use. It'll reduce the amount of plastic that gets discarded into the environment. But it also gets consumers thinking about the topic. And I think that's a really critical point here that can't be uh, underestimated. I have to say, I agree with you 40 million percent um, about educating the public um, because, you know, I even see in the trash in my own building. I mean, I see things I say, wow, that that could be recycled. And I think what needs to this is Gary's edit, this is Gary's op ed piece. What needs to be done is communicated to everybody that everybody needs to participate in it. it. You know, when we talk about all the green and sustainable initiatives, it sounds to the general public like it's somebody else's job to do. And if we, in, you know, somebody said, well, you know, what really pollutes is, uh, you know, the airplanes and the cars and the buildings, which we individually don't really, I mean, I guess with cars, we control somewhat. Um, but the notion of recycling should be in everybody's mind to make people realize, not necessarily to, you know, change the carbon content of the air, but to get everybody to realize that it's all of our responsibility. Right. I mean, I'm a, I, I know that you agree with that. So it's a very good point. And I think the, the, the one thing to remember is that, right, there, there's two strategies. There's the top down strategy, which is sort of putting regulations on things like fossil fuel companies, um, emissions from really uh, heavy polluting sectors. And those are absolutely critical, critical to making a dent uh, in sort of uh, the carbon that we put into the atmosphere, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, all of that. It's really, really important. And that uh, the importance of that cannot be just set aside by saying that it's all about consumer responsibility. That's something that many uh, heavy polluting companies uh, try to do and portray it sort of like right. greenwashing. Uh, but I do think that there's a lot of truth in it not just being all about that. Uh, for, it, yeah. it, it becomes very hard to deny the effect of what we have done to our atmosphere. All you got to do is look at a weather report, certainly this winter, but at any time through the year. I mean, towns and cities are being devastated by by weather. I mean, I don't care what political party you're in. You're, Open, open your window and or your blinds and shades, literally, and take a look. There was an interactive map that you talked about. Um, explain to me what this map is about and why this is important in this dialogue. Sure. And so this is sort of what I was alluding to uh, before, the idea of making sustainability accessible to all. Right. And the important thing here is that, for example, in New York City, we have stores that are offering items that are, are in this realm of sustainability, you know, a toothbrush that's not made of plastic, uh, containers that you can refill with, you know, toothpaste tablets instead of these, you know, toothpaste. Wow. Tablets. Yeah, that, that's another item. Or, you know, you think about there's a million of what do you do with that tube when you're done? Absolutely. Throw it in the trash. Right. And, you know, so, and, and you kill, throw it in the trash, kill a fish. Yeah, okay. absolutely. <laughs> 
So these are these are actually out there right now. People are thinking about this, and you know, business owners in the city are trying to come up with ways or with ways to sort of make these sustainable options available to people. The issue here is that there are a lot more of the other options, the not sustainable options than the sustainable ones. So with an interactive map, one thing we hoped, and we weren't the first people to do this, you know, there's other groups, there's other maps available, and I highly recommend looking at all of them. Uh, the idea is to help consumers, help individual individuals find mm -hmm. sustainable option near them. Uh, uh, listen, um, I, again, that's all part of this we're all in this. You you wrote about something that I had never really heard about, um, that, and, and I'm, I'm literally going to quote your article, microplastics found in the water and air and often plastic microfibers shed from clothing during washing and normal use. I had never heard that. So what, what we're talking about is when, when, I, when I wash this shirt, let's say, some, something more than I'm aware of happens? Absolutely, and I'm really... Mm -hmm. Really, no idea. Glad, I'm glad you brought this up because <laughs> okay. many people fall into that camp of not being aware. And no idea. we've seen the imagery of bulk plastic, you know, aligning the seashore, forming little islands in the ocean. But there are these plastics uh, that we can't see, at least with the naked eye, that are microscopic and they're called microplastics. They come from sometimes larger bulk plastics uh, that undergo degradation, sort of like a bottle that starts to fall apart into tiny little pieces, or they can sort of be in the form of fibers. And those fibers, like you were alluding to, can come from clothing. So like a polyester t-shirt, for example, is woven together by these uh, micro uh, fibers that are plastic. And when you wash it, when you wash it in the washing machine, uh, those fibers will start falling off. And Amazing. Those They'll just go out into uh, the water stream. Yeah. I, I, people ask me, what are your favorite uh, programs that you do? And the programs where I learn something are my favorite ones. I just learned something. So I uh, really appreciate it. Um, l let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, kind of a final message to people who are watching right now. What What is it that they need to know and need to do. To me, I'm going to start the dialogue and say the first thing is consciousness. You've got to be conscious of, of like, feel upset when this runs out of, out of ink and you throw it away and you're like, wait a minute, is it the wrong item? Should I put it somewhere else? Is there a place to recycle something like that? To me, just thinking that gets us all going. But but for you, what what is the bottom line here? Absolutely. I've got about 45 seconds to do it. Absolutely. The bottom line is that the things that we use and the actions that we take uh, have an impact. They have impacts on other people and on other species in the environment. Uh, things that we use go somewhere. They don't. There's this mindset sometimes of throw it away, away where, sort of like you were saying. Yeah, away. <laughs> we need to have just a more sustainable drop the mindset. bottom of the ocean. Just go direct. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, listen, Carl, um, what, social media, how do they stay in touch with you? How do people say, yeah, we want to partner, we want to support, what do we got to do? Absolutely. So you can visit us at Project uh, on Project Defeat Denial's website, which is defeatdenial.com. Uh, I can also be accessed through the local Sierra Club, the NYC Sierra Club, uh, dot com, right. and uh, on Twitter as well. Listen, you can see, you can talk to them, you can get to them. Let's all work together and make a better world. Isn't that what we try to do every day? That's what we're trying to do. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Carl Palmquist. I, I just want to get it right. He's the co-founder of Project Defeat Denial and uh, the vice chair of uh, the uh, Sierra Club. Uh, Carl, thanks so much for being with us in the Bronx Buzz. We're going to take a quick break. Then we'll come back and we're going to talk about the Bronx River Art Center. Brack. One of the best places in the Bronx. Don't go away. If you're struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit, or call toll free at 833-511-0311. That's 833-511-0311.
right, back with you on the Bronx Buzz. We thank Mr. Palmquist for being with us. And now we're going to do something that I am also completely passionate about uh, from a different uh, perspective, and uh, that is maybe the best organization, which is a horrible thing to say in the beautiful Bronx. In the Bronx, it's the Bronx River Art Center. And uh, first, uh, say hello to my longtime friend, Gail Nathan. Nice to have you with us, Gail. Hi, Gary. Very nice. nice to be here. Thank you. And uh, Gail brought along Rachel Klepa, who is an independent uh, curator and worked on this uh, very exciting um, exhibit, which is up now at the Bronx River Art Center, Among Women, Contemporary Art from Serbia. Um, Gail, why don't you just start and talk about why and how this uh, exhibit came about and why you thought it was appropriate for the beautiful uh, Bronx River Art Center? Uh, so um, we actually got it from uh, an open call to curators. Um, and Rachel was one of the uh, people who submitted a proposal. And uh, we looked at it and we thought it was very, very interesting. Um, anybody who has watched the uh, history of this country, particularly its Civil War, knows that one of the big issues um, there in many places is uh, uh, freedom of women uh, in their society. And uh, particularly now when um, American women's uh, freedom is being challenged again, which is mind blowing hmm. um, after 50 years of uh, uh, us having control of our own bodies. Um, that um, it's just such a big issue. And this was a show that just snapped into place there it's, in terms it, of, in well, terms I, of the women, it's all the, and Rachel can talk about the show mm -hmm. and sure, that we're, it's we're all do that. women. I, I just want to establish, and one of the things that's on your agenda, um, which I know is to find culturally significant and culturally relatable um, uh, art that communicates something to the people of the Bronx. Did I just articulate what you are thinking about? I mean, it... yes, and in this case, it's it's to uh, particularly to women, um, but of course, this is a big issue for for all people, all humans, right. uh, and and in this case, it doesn't always have to be exactly specific to the people of the Bronx in terms of, um, you know, whether they're born here, the artists, right. or whether they're whatever it's but it's it's issues that really are meaningful to to the to all people and this right. in, in particular women uh, and I might just add that it turned out um, that all the shows that we selected for this year and I didn't know this it was serendipitous that we picked all the shows we picked are all women artists Wow fascinating and that without even without, without even trying conscious um, decision so right. um, so let's bring Rachel in. Rachel, um, talk to me about um, what artists were selected. Um, who are they? Uh, you know, how, how, how did we get them to put it all together and make this exhibit? Well, I've been focusing on contemporary art from Serbia as a researcher since, well, since 2017. Uh, my research on the region sort of stems back 10 years now at this point. And the women that I asked to be in this show are women that I either met during my trips to Serbia, women artists that were recommended to me, women whose work I saw in exhibitions while, while being in Serbia. And I wanna be very specific here. This is a very Belgrade based show because that's where I've been spending the most of my time. So. This does not represent all women artists in the country. It's that's fascinating. Very, yeah. Yeah, very particular to Belgrade. And they all have very diverse art practices. It was not easy to select the women for this show because there are so many female artists. And I really look at this exhibition as an initial inquiry to look at the contemporary art scene of Belgrade from the perspective of its female artists. And I would hope it could grow in some way and, and evolve to involve more women artists across the country to even get a more comprehensive view to see what they're saying and, and how they're approaching. The I, I'm, I'm always interested in um, defining and redefining our borough 
Um, talk to me about the nature of taking artwork from across the world and basically um, interfacing this with what Gail said, that it becomes culturally significant. What have you found here about, you know, putting on a display like that, that has some, some you know, for want of a better term, body and, and, and strength and, and point of view to it? Well, Gary, I mean, it's been hard, right? There's been a lot of things that I didn't anticipate in terms of being the face of the exhibition because the women are oh. here, right? Um, so this has been a learning curve for me, but I think that people are relating to this show on a lot of different levels. Uh, for instance, there's a work by Marina Markovic, which is a sonogram of her empty womb. And you hear the women in her family telling her very directly what her role is as a woman. And I think- Let, I, let me just ask that. Now you say that you hear, so there's an audio component to that? Yeah, there's oh. an audio component and it's very direct and it's very painful to listen to. And I think of all the things that I've heard as a woman in the United States, maybe not as directly as Marina's female family members are saying, but in very passive aggressive ways. Or uh, Boyana's work, A Queen of Montenegro, which explores how women are not represented in Montenegrin family trees. Uh, obviously, in my family, which is Serbian, we do know who the women are that makes up our family tree. But the the invisibility of women in Montenegrin culture, I have a woman, I as a woman have felt invisible many times. Wow. And I've heard how other women have felt invisible as well. So there's there's many layers to this show that direct that deal that deal directly with women's issues, but also the isolation of capitalism, because Serbia was once part of Yugoslavia and functioned in a socialist economy. Mm -hmm. And now it is a capitalist country and how people have been dealing with that transition and wow. the isolation that it brings. So there are many different ways that you could enter the space, relate to the work artistically, but socially as well. So right. there, there's many things to consider. Gail, this is a very personal work. Um, you know, we, we um, uh, there are some images of women that are different. Um, talk to me from a personal point of view, from you as an art uh, um, uh, consumer, uh, when you walk through there, maybe after you put it up before you invited the public in, um, what, what, how did it strike you when, you know, as somebody who is, looks at artwork of all different types, um, what, what, what effect did it have on you individually? Well, it's, it's clearly, it's a very, um, intense show and it's a very, um, it, it's a very broad show in the way it touches on very, uh, many issues that are not just women's issues, but it's women's perspective on issues. So for example, um, one of the works in the show um, is about um, gentrification. Hmm. Um, and of course, right? And it isn't that a topic for the Bronx? Um, and, and, uh, and it shows uh, buildings being torn down and, um, and, well, and, and, raw, and raw buildings and, and here we are in the midst of, of that issue uh, intensely sure. in our borough. Um, let's talk about um, this. So now the show is up. Um, let's see if I remember off the top of my head, 1087 East Tremont Avenue. Is that what we're talking about? That's where Correct. we are. Correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't even look it up and I didn't have it in my notes. That and you just remember? Shows it. Uh, I've been there enough to know. Um, and so um, how often the, the show is open every day. Um, let's get that. And then let's put this show in context with other stuff that the Bronx River Art Center is doing. Sure. The, um, the show is up through February 27th. Um, and it's open from Tuesday through Friday uh, at 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. And then it's open on Saturday from noon to 5. You know, great. You know, I think about this show and what we've already talked about. I think about a, a school group coming by, um, a, a parents, you know, specifically with daughters, but it, certainly sons need to be educated as well. Parents saying, hey, here's something interesting, letting the kids see it and all that kind of stuff. I think that that, that that's uh, just so important. Uh, before we run out of time, Gail, um, just um, what do you got coming up? You got a lot of stuff. You said, uh, you know, what we have this year, you've got it all laid out, right? We're, you're all ready to go. 
Right. Well, again, as I said, we've got um, we have all our exhibitions are by are of women artists and by curated by women, uh, except for one is curated by a man. But um, they come up. Uh, we have a video production coming up um, right immediately after the, the show comes down. Um, we have an incredible show of Latinx women from all over the country. Um, curated by uh, Nicholas Duvet Estevaz, Esteba, um, and he uh, he's a we're, Bronx we're based all, curator. Again, we're, we're almost out of time, so you have that. You also and have, I have a you have performance coming performance, up that's what I was ask you uh, on the end of uh, February on the 26th or 27th. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful um, um, jazz pianist woman. Uh, and for Black History Month, the Black Artist. So, uh, Black.org? Is that Bronx River Art Center.org? What, what is the website? Bronx River Art. Org. Bronx River Art. Org. Rachel, um, we'll give you about uh, 30 seconds. Um, what are you working on next? Uh, the next project I'm working on is actually another project uh, coming out of Serbia. It's called Foto Documenti. It's not my project. I'm working with two curators, Miroslav Karic and Slajna Petrovic Varagic. We'll be bringing that show to Pittsburgh next year. So wow. I'm actually really excited to work with them on that. Uh, listen, Rachel, um, I, I know this is the first time you've been through the Bronx. I hope you'll come back again and show yeah. more and more stuff. This is, you know, culture, culture, culture. That's how we're going to save our borough. Um, so, Gail Nathan, um, nice to see you again. And always nice a to pleasure you, to have Gary. you. And Rachel Klepa, um, we appreciate you and uh, all the great work. And thanks for bringing your stuff to the Bronx. We want it. We want to see it. We want to love it. And uh, we got we got a great exhibition hall for you right there in, on East Tremont Avenue. Anyway, folks, uh, that'll be it for um, this evening. It is it's uh, um, been a great show, uh, just meeting and uh, talking to uh, some new people and also an old friend. And guess what's going to happen? Just guess. You're right. We'll be back next week. Good night.